Hello everybody, welcome to Statistics and Theory. This is Dr. Vahid Aryadus, and in this presentation I'm going to show you how to use JASP, which is a free software package, to do structural equation modeling. You can download JASP from this website. I will provide the link in the comment section under this video. Uh, the structural equation modeling module in JASP is basically uh, an integration of Levon, which is an R package, and in this uh, link you can s find more information about it. So I'm going to use exactly the same data that you see in this uh, in this uh, window, and we'll show you how to run the analysis. The uh, coding that I will present here will, will be uh, the codes from Levon, but I should say that it's extremely easy to learn and I suggest that you just spend a little bit of time really to wrap your mind around how to write the code and how to run the analysis in JASP. The Levon project itself is available in this link. I will also provide this link and as always uh, <coughs> I suggest that you take a look at this book uh, Quantitative Data Analysis for Language uh, Assessment Volume 2 specifically this uh, uh, chapter under part two, structural equation modeling in language assessment, which we wrote, in which we talk about some of the fundamental concepts of SEM. So without any further ado, let's get started with uh, JASP. JASP's interface is quite user-friendly and it, it looks looks like this. If you have watched my previous videos on using Jamovi, you will see that there is um, a lot of similarities between the two software packages. So if you can work with one of them, you most likely can work with the other one as well. In order to open your data set, you need to go to this uh, section here, uh, these three lines, and click on it and go to open. <coughs> and you can actually open any data set, for example, your recent data file or any, any data file in the rich data library uh, of JASP itself. So I'm going to scroll down to uh, the structural SEM, structural equation modeling chapter four, uh, 14, and open this data set. The data set uh, includes some indicators of industrialization in 1960 and political democracy in 1960 and 1965. But I'm not going to talk about the theoretical framework at all. What I would like to stress is that this presentation will only be about how to run the analysis and some of the most uh, perhaps fundamental or most important concepts that we need to know when we are doing structural equation modeling. So you click on this and you can open it. If uh, you want to open your own data, you can go to recent data sets or uh, computer if you haven't opened any recent data sets. I have opened quite a few as you see here. And you can browse to open your data set. Your, your data sets can be anything including uh, SPSS uh, in these, these formats. Well, basically, uh, SAS, um, SAV is S SPSS, uh, text, etc. So, uh, since I've already opened that data set, I'm going to go back to this. Um, I have quite a few variables here. Next is that I want to in include these variables into my structural equation model. Since you don't see any S SEM uh, tabs here, uh, so we need to add it from this module menu. I click on the plus sign, pretty much like what we saw in Jamovi. I scroll down to find SEM, I click on it, and you immediately get it on the menu. Now I click on uh, SEM because I want to do a structural equation modeling. I click on this, and this window appears. Now you don't see those variables. The reason is that we need to write a little bit of coding, very easy and straightforward. I've prepared two codes for you here, and I'm going to quickly walk you through these codes. Um, the basic analysis for every SEM, which I believe it gives you with a decent sort of model and allows you to uh, run the analysis uh, or make it publication uh, ready, is something like this. As you see, um, uh, we have three sections which are differentiated by the hash sign. So uh, the first section is the latent variable section. The second one is hash, a hashtag or hash sign regressions. And the last one, which is basically optional, is residual covariances. So if you think that re the residuals are not, uh, are not linked or are not 
correlated with each other, you don't have to really include this section at all. So you will be fine with having only two sections. That will allow you to start doing a basic structural equation modeling. But what do we have inside these sections? First of all, uh, you, you know, let's say we have got three concepts or three variables, three latent variables, and you want to find out their effects on each other or the relationship between each other. So then we will have to have three lines, one for each of them. Here, the first latent variable, uh, as you see, is ind, that's industrialization, 60. And um, if you want to visualize it, well, this will be right here industrialization right in this corner industrialization 60 so that's the first latent variable the second one uh, is dem 60 and as you see is d60 it has been represented by this circle and the last one is dem 65 which is right here and therefore if you have more latent variables you can include more lines here um, you do not immediately get to see this uh, this part, this uh, SEM graph, uh, it will be generated, of course, later after you run the codes. Um, let's say you have got more latent variables, you just add them, add them in here. Uh, how to choose the names of the latent variables like DEM65 is absolutely up to you. I suggest that you choose something simple, for example, factor 1, factor 2, factor 3, or F1, F2, F3, uh, if you do not forget them. Next is that you need to say how each of these variables, latent variables, is measured. And for the first one, we have got, if you look at the right-hand side here, we've got three variables, one, two, and three, represented by x's, x1, x2, and x3. And the direction of the arrows, which run from the latent variable to the boxes, indicates that this latent variable measures uh, sorry, this latent variable is indicated by or is measured by these three uh, uh, these three observed variables. So we represent it by this sign here, uh, equal to and followed by tilde with no spaces. It's very important to remember that we need to have a space before equal to tilde and after equal to tilde. Then the first, the name of the first variable, which is x1, plus x2 plus x3. In the same way, we need to indicate how the, the rest of the latent variables are measured. Again, the name of the latent variable, which we choose according to our theoretical framework, as I said, followed by equal sign tilde and followed by the uh, name of these observed variables. Now, the most important thing, as you see here, the most important thing here at this step is that the name of those x, y, x2, etc. should be exactly the same as these names here. So if you want to change y1 to anything else, you can double click, uh, you can you can click on this uh, on this on this section, and perhaps, um, um, and well, th this is actually for changing the the type of scale. I mean, we can we can just keep it as uh, scale as is. Um, so if you uh, do not follow exactly the same sort of naming or labeling as you have uh, as, as you can see here I think later on you will certainly get some error messages so try to create that correspondence between your codes and what you already actually have in your data set next is uh, dem 65 and it is represented by y5 to old y2 y8 and that's what you see y5 y6 7 and 8 so this indicates that our last uh, variable is uh, basically represented or is indicated by these four observed variables. The next thing is uh, what we call regressions. Let's remember that this section of our model and this one and this one are actually what we call, uh, let me write it here for you, measurement models. Okay. Sorry, it's a bit difficult to write on the screen of the computer. I hope you can you can read my handwriting. Uh, so measurement models. In in other words, we have got three measurement models: model one, model two, 
and model 3. So what latent variable section serves to do is to specify these three measurement models. If you have more measurement models then you will have more lines here, each line indicating or representing one of those measurement models. The measurement models also go by the name confirmatory factor analysis. Simple CFA models which I have explained in previous videos and I'll make sure to leave those links for you to if you have not watched those videos I suggest that you spend some time to watch those CFA videos. So they also go by CFA because um, it's in a sense it's a confirmatory fact analysis model but it's a simple one because it only includes one each each measurement model includes only one latent variable. Next is regressions. This part actually is analogous to or is the same as uh, the structural part because you want to investigate the relationship, the structural relationships between these three latent variables right on the right hand side. Okay, let me go back to the code here. Uh, so in this uh, in this section you you what you're saying is that uh, dem60 that's um, d60 this is right here is um, uh, and um, in 60, that's um, in 60, this one, are related. In, in what ways? It means that in 60 has an impact over this way. I mean, the arrow runs from in 60 to dem 60. So in 60 has an impact on dem 60. The next one in the same way is that DEM uh, 65, that's D65, that's really this one here. Uh, I hope you can see what I'm saying. Uh, this one receives two effects from I60 and D60. That's uh, that's how we specify it. Uh, end 60 and D DM60 have an impact over DM65. So whatever is after the tilde, if, if you don't mind, let me just clean this a little bit. Actually, it's, it's getting really difficult to read. Okay, this is much better. Uh, so um, wh what we are saying here is that uh, DM is an endogenous variable which receives two impacts, one from uh, end 60 and the other one is from DM 60. So these two are exogenous variables with respect to the DM, DM 65. On, on this graph, since the, uh, s the head of the arrow is pointing towards uh, D65 or DEM65, uh, this becomes an endogenous variable, uh, whereas uh, this one will will be an exogenous variable with, with respect to this, and I60 will also be an exogenous variable with respect to this one here. Uh, so uh, if you have more, vari more, more latent variables or more relationships, this is how you represent it. On the one hand, you will have uh, on, on the one hand, you will include the um, endogenous variable on the on the left hand side like this, and on the other hand, you will include ex the exogenous variables on the right hand side like these two. Okay, so now let's let's move on to the last section of our code, and that's residual covariances. As you see, the correlations between the residuals of each of the indicators or the items. Uh, are represented by two tilde signs with two spaces on both sides. So Y1 and uh, Y5, basically they're uh, covariances, not the items really, but the, co uh, the sorry, the residuals, not the items, uh, have been covariate. That's, in other words, they are correlated with each other. And if you want to see this on this graph, uh, this, this is a graph that I've gotten from um, JASP itself. So as you see those two-headed arrows right here uh, indicate those correlations between residuals but what we need to remember is, especially for those of you who have worked with Amos, is that we do not exactly see that uh, the so-called little uh, circle that represents the error term on each of these items, you know, like that. In Amos, you can see them. So if we are covariating residuals, we're basically what we are covariating is these two residuals, not the items themselves. So we shouldn't be uh, confused by the two-headed arrows that are that are connect connecting the items. In fact, th these are not connecting the items. They're only correlating residuals, not the items themselves. So this is really just good enough for us 
for our first analysis. I'm going to copy this just for ease and uh, paste it into uh, uh, go to SCM again and paste it into this space. I will provide these codes for you uh, in the comments section. I'll either provide the whole uh, file as an attachment which you can download from Google Drive or I just will uh, copy and paste the codes there for you so you can just easily copy and paste it into your analysis. So um, here I paste everything here and the analysis has not been done because as uh, JASP is telling us we need to cont uh, press control and enter at the same time so I'm going to hit both and the analysis is done as you see on the right hand side. That's really as easy as that. So uh, let's go through the output here. Um, well, so we haven't done, uh, we haven't chosen quite a few uh, statistics here, which I think we should we should do uh, in order to get the results. Okay, now the results are out. What we can uh, look for here and uh, get in the uh, in the output is, for example, the R squared values under statistics, um, and perhaps Mardius coefficient. I will talk about it. Uh, um, in the output and on, under the options uh, we have quite a few options here I will talk about them uh, later and finally in the advanced section I think it's very important for us to get the uh, path diagram and I'll talk about the path diagram soon too and I'll leave the rest as is because they're important for us if we unclick some of them uh, the data here the output will disappear next I'll go back to uh, this win window here and uh, sorry th th this part of the output and I, I would like to quickly walk you through uh, the results uh, one of the things that we see here is the uh, the fit statistics and AIC and BIC are the most imp important fit stats for us followed by chi-squared value and the p-value of chi-squared you can also divide chi-squared by D, uh, degrees of freedom that's 38.125 divided by 35 which will be something slightly above 1 which is pretty good as long as the chi-squared divided by degrees of freedom which is also known as normed chi-square uh, is smaller than, uh, than 3 uh, that's good news for our model we have some indication that the model fits the data pretty well and um, I'm, I'm really delighted to see that there is a non-significant p-value for our chi-squared value because this indicates that there is no significant difference between our model and the uh, covariance structure of the actual covariance structure of the data. Uh, most often when you have large sample size this becomes uh, significant which is not really a very big deal because not many people would rely on chi-square values nowadays because we have got other statistics. BIC and uh, AIC are used to compare different models. So if you're looking at B BIC and AIC uh, per se and you want to interpret them actually they don't make any sense unless you have a second model uh, which is nested within the current model and I've talked about it in previous videos by the way um, uh, and then you compare the two. The smaller these two fit statistics the better the fit and that indicates the smaller the these two fit statistics the smaller the error uh, in your in your uh, in your model. So um, really we shouldn't dwell too much on this and we should move on to see uh, to look at the rest of the fit statistics which I, I think I should actually choose here uh, from additional fit measures and go back to the output and here are the additional fit measures. Uh, well in the same uh, book that I a book chapter that I mentioned here um, this structural equation modeling book chapter we have discussed how to interpret these fit statistics in the previous videos I have also done that I will provide links to the videos and the book chapter as I said it, long story short we are looking for CFI or comparative fit stats or index or Tucker Lewis index which also goes by um, um, which is very similar actually to an NFI um, we we need to get something more than I mean, some people, some literature says uh, 0 
and depending on the sample size and the number of parameters some people also will be happy with something around 0 0.9 uh, but as a rule of thumb the, the larger the better and certainly if you have something below 0 0.9 that's a little bit of a red flag. So some of them are commonly used in structural equation modeling literature, like uh, CFI and TLI and NFI. Uh, the rest of them are not that much common, to be honest, at least in the literature that I read in the language assessment field. So one, uh, so one, um, sorry, okay. So the CFI is one of them, TLI is another one, and NFI uh, is another one which you can uh, which you can report. Um, so, well, these statistics, like I said, are also useful if you are comparing different models with each other. Now, oh, it just keeps jumping back, back in front. Okay, so um, let's go through the parameters and see what kind of estimates we have gotten. Uh, the best thing for us to start with is the p-value. In other words, we need all of these uh, uh, relationships to be statistically significant, the relationships between latent variables and the items like this. Uh, so as you see, the p-values are all small, smaller than 0 0.01. Now we also have the correlations between some of the uh, residuals, which is uh, in which in some cases are significant, in some cases they're not significant. For those cases which are not significant, you can drop them like this one which is the correlation between Y4, act, actually the residual of Y4 and the residual of Y2. You can drop it in the formula that I wrote. And this one is certainly not significant, 0 0.1991. Uh, so you can also drop that and you can go through the rest of those correlation uh, uh, r correlations between the residuals of your uh, items to figure out which one is or is not significant and if they're not just drop them from the analysis. The next thing is the relationship between uh, our uh, latent variables. Um, well, um, well, so, so I'm afraid they have not been they have not been specified yet because uh, well we we can uh, add that to the rest to we can we can add that relationship between them in the following round of analysis in that's in this round of analysis before we go in there um, I would like to stress that what we're looking for here is the effect of these variables uh, variable 1 and variable 2 on variable 3 okay so there are two types of effects one is a direct effect from I60, that's variable 1, to D65, that's variable 3. That's that's the first one. The other one is also a direct one, that's from D60 to D65. Uh, for convenience, we can call the first one direct and the second one a, a beta. I mean, really doesn't matter what you call it, but since we need to include these in into the formula, so let's just stick with beta for this relationship between this latent variable and this latent variable. And the relationship between latent variable 1 and 2 can be also called alpha. So let's stick with alpha for this relationship as well. What we are doing in this figure is to figure out how 1 affects 3 and how 2 affects 3 directly, but also the indirect effect of 1 mediated through 2 on 3. So this path from 1 to 3. This a path like this. Okay, so we want to see if uh, 1, a latent variable 1, has an indirect effect uh, in addition to the direct effect that it, it exerts. Will it have an indirect effect on variable 3 or not? So this is the output of the following analysis which I've already I paste it into this Excel sheet, but I will have to first run the analysis before walking you through that output. So I go back to uh, this uh, this part and would like to uh, here walk you quickly through this code to let you know what I have included. Okay, so the first part is exactly the same. The second part is also almost exactly the same, except that I have added these lines which are in 
red. The reason why, as you see, uh, I've only added, for example, for the first one, alpha times. The reason why I've done this is that I want to get the uh, uh, the uh, the, the path or the regression coefficient from dem60 uh, from from dem60 to uh, to end 60 so uh, sorry from the, the other way around I'm sorry from end 60 that's this one to dem60 as you remember this was alpha so the second one is uh, beta and dem that's from here to here this beta and then I also want to get the direct one that's the direct one if, if you remember the direct one from uh, uh, in 60 so together I, I want to add them up uh, to figure out what is the direct effect of I 60 on D 65 uh, as well as its indirect effect as I said before um, th mediated through D60. Now, uh, this is how the code should be written. So if you have got more variables, you can just add on more uh, codes, for example, plus, gamma, times, uh, something else, uh, if you've got three variables. Now this, this part, you can just really copy and paste it into your analysis, regardless of how many variables you have, with one exception, if you've got more uh, alpha, beta, gamma, etc. You can just include times, gamma, times, something else. Um, I mean, uh, for, na for naming, you can refer to Levon's uh, manual. If you've got more than three, uh, I think Levon gives you a very good idea. In the future, uh, I'll try to discuss that uh, more. I'll try to present a more complex sort of uh, structural equation model for you. Next is, uh, you include total and then you, you include proportion. I will explain these in the output in the Excel sheet. And finally, the residuals will remain the same. If you're interested, you can just remove any of these residuals. And by the way, since we've got a plus sign here, we simply indicate that Y2 is correlated with uh, Y4 and Y6. So there, there are uh, three, correlation, uh, three correlations, if I'm not wrong. Uh, sorry, two co correlations, one between one uh, Y4 and Y2 and the other one between Y6 and Y2. So there are two correlations altogether here. Uh, okay, so uh, let's copy and paste this four section code into this side of the analysis. And as just like the previous analysis, uh, hit uh, uh, control and enter to run the analysis and the analysis is done again. So the ARC and BIC shouldn't change that much really. Um, now I would like to add more information about how to interpret the rest of these columns. First of all, we have an estimate and this estimate is basically a non-standardized non estimate. Uh, that's the relationship between, uh, in this case, the independent, the, uh, latent variable and the indicator x1. So th the estimate is one because it was set to one, so it's not estimated exactly, but the standardized estimates are here. As you see, there are three types of standardized estimates. And if you go to Levon's uh, um, website, you will see that they have been explained. In short, uh, STD or standardized um, LV here uh, stands for standardized estimates um, that have been calculated based on the variances of the latent variable only. So LV stands for latent variable. The second one, so in this case, the stand, standardized form of EST is 0 0.67. It's estimated only based on the latent variable, uh, which is end 60. Next, um, standardized all is basically a standardized estimate that's based on both the variance of uh, observed variables and the latent variables and that's why you have a higher um, amount here and the next one an OX uh, is basically the standardized estimates uh, which are based on both the variance of the observed variable and the latent variable but not including the variance of exogenous um, exogenous covariances. If you have any 
exogenous coversus. In this case, since we don't have uh, any exogenous, um, I mean, cover exogenous covariates, sorry, uh, so we do not see any differences between all and in OX. And by exogenous, I mean, let me just represent it for you quickly. For example, in this case, if we had an exogenous uh, variable like this, whatever, let's call this A, and if A had an influence on X3, then this, this would be an exogenous variable. So then, uh, in this case, we don't have such exogenous variables, as a result of which uh, we see that uh, in OX and STD all are exactly the same for all of the variables if you scroll down. In most cases um, I think they will be the same. Now um, the very important thing for us is this section in which alpha uh, times beta, that's the indirect effect, plus the direct and indirect effect and the proportion of those effects having calculated. So I've already copied and pasted this side, this part, <coughs> into my Excel sheet and I'd like to quickly show you how to read this. For alpha, uh, alpha is, as you see, the, the effect of uh, I60, that's this one, on uh, DEM or D60. Okay, so that's uh, that's how we can uh, make sense of it. So it's, it's called alpha, as you see here. It's called alpha, and the amount, that's the effect of I60, uh, based on LV, is 0 0.447. So alpha, we've gotten, we've gotten value for alpha. How about the, the value for beta? The value for beta is here, is 0 0.885. So uh, the value for beta is quite high, which means that uh, this variable, variable number three, has a huge uh, influence coming from D60. And so the beta is pretty high. Now the, the thing is, we all also, we're also looking for the indirect effect of this number one mediated by number two on number three. So in order to do that, we, c we need to uh, multiply alpha by beta. And that's what we get uh, you know, as the indirect effect. So we ha uh, we have already done that in the output, alpha times beta. So you you multiply this by this. If you have a calculator, you can get something around 0 0.394 something, which you can round up to 0 0.395. What does that mean? It means that this variable has an indirect effect, which is mediated through this on the variable three. Uh, when we mediate something through another variable, what we are doing is uh, basically we're, we're taking an indirect path from the effect of that variable on the endogenous variable of interest. Next is the direct effect of this variable on this. And as you see, uh, is here indicated by the, uh, the, this blue, uh, this blue uh, cell. Well, the amount of that is 0 0.182. And it's very interesting, therefore, to know that the direct effect of variable 1 on 3 is much less, about 3 times, more or less, uh, uh, less than, is that 3 or 2 times, maybe 2 something times, uh, less than its indirect effect mediated by variable number 2. So I'm not using those D and EM, uh, you know, D, M, I, N, D, etc., not to confuse you. Um, so th that's how we calculate it. And finally, the direct plus indirect effect, if you add them up, uh, adds up to uh, a total of 0 0.578, which means that the amount of variance that is explained in this, in this variable is around this, this much. And that's actually quite high, because that's the amount of, uh, I mean, based on most of the literature, uh, that that amount of variance can be uh, considered to be pretty high. Finally, you can also calculate the proportion of the indirect to total, which is uh, 0 0.685, which I think is not, in my opinion, is, is not as important as the effect of total, the total effect, that's the combination of indirect and direct effect. Uh, the other thing I would like to quickly talk about is uh, <coughs> 
uh, is this is the estimation methods that are used. Um, I'm also going to show you Amos. Why well, I should say that Amos has got similar estimation patterns uh, or methods. If you like to compare them, I mean, you can use the same data set to see if Amos and JASP give you the same output or not. The first thing is ML or maximum likelihood. And it's often used when your data is continuous and also when you're uh, when um, when you have a normally distributed sample, then you've got generalized least squares, which is often or uh, here GLS, so they are the same. Which is often used when your data is not normally distributed, or the sample size is small. In the same way, we've got unweighted least square or ULS, and this is not also used for normal distributed data. Um, most often, in, in the same way, we've got scale-free least squares, uh, which I would say is also the same, but you cannot see scale-free least squares here. What we have, on the other hand, in JAS, which is which is uh, miss, uh, missing in Amos, is DWLS, and this stands for diagonally weighted least square, which is an excellent choice if you have got ordinal data. Uh, so if you if you choose this, uh, th one of the first things that you will observe is that a AIC and BIC is not estimated because AIC and BIC are mostly uh, estimated under only maximum likelihood. So maximum likelihood has an advantage, and that's it allows you to compare the models with each other by using AIC and BIC, whereas uh, DWLS does not provide you with AIC and BIC. Of course, you can still get. Uh, the rest of those fit statistics that I mentioned before, like TLI and CFI and NFI. So uh, it's an advantage. Another advantage of, uh, I mean, an advantage of DWLS on uh, maximum likelihood is that it m often gives you a better fit when your data is not continuous, it's uh, ordinal. Interestingly, in this case, uh, as I have, I mean, I've copied this before and pasted it here. Uh, just to represent. Um, as you see, the maximum likelihood estimation has got lower fit statistics compared with the DW, uh, DWLS, which has got much higher fit statistics. Uh, don't worry about these fits if they are around one or even larger. Some literature says that's pretty fine. Uh, it only indicates that your model is fitting the data pretty well. Uh, I'm going back to this uh, analysis and finally, I would like to, you know, include my previous code, uh, the the easier one here. And the reason is that if you include these uh, additional effects, you will not be able to to get the diagram, unfortunately. So what I would like to do is to remove them, uh, remove the previous one, and include the simpler one, and hit Control and Enter, so uh, I can get the diagram. This is the diagram. Um, let me show you how to change this diagram. You can scroll down to uh, path diagram. You can either choose the M plus uh, format, which looks like this. Uh, it actually looks pretty cool to me. I think it's really public, almost publication friendly. And at the same time, you can also include uh, standardized parameters into your model, which makes it look even cooler. And you have all the standardized parameters in this model. In addition, you can change the format into the X format, EQS, and scroll down to get to see it. I mean, this is another format. Some people might prefer this. As you see, the uh, arrows are thicker in this um, uh, f uh, format. And if you like, you can just click on uh, path diagram and copy it and paste it into uh, you know, a Word document like this. I've already done that actually into the Excel sheet like this, yeah. Uh, so that is all about uh, how to run structural equation modeling in uh, JASP. I think it's really useful and straightforward. You, we just need to spend some time to wrap our mind around these codes, which again, in my opinion, is easy to understand. And I hope you find this video useful. If you found it useful, please give it a like and stay tuned in for more videos in the future. Have a great day.